general principles in the assessment and treatment of non-unions. This is from the Orthopedic Trauma Association Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series, version three. Um, the slides are by Drs. Summers and Chan. Uh, I'm Sake Brahman, narrating the slides. So let's just get through some definitions first. Um, and the problem is non-union itself is somewhat arbitrarily defined. Uh, essentially, it's a fracture that has not and is not going to heal. So to some degree, there's a, there's a prediction you're making. You're saying that this is not going to heal, as opposed to a delayed union uh, clearly hasn't healed yet, and it's taken more time than usual to heal. Uh, and it might heal, um, but clearly at this point it's delayed. Uh, but it seems to be showing some progression. And that's kind of how we use those terms. Um, the FDA has uh, uh, used this definition, a fracture that is a minimum of nine months post-occurrence and is not healed and has not shown uh, radiographic progression for three months. Um, of course, to some degree, it's not really practical. Uh, nine months is oftentimes not what uh, some patients will tolerate. Um, uh, waiting this long sometimes can lead to narcotic uh, addiction and there can be work-related or emotional impairments. So a lot of times we're trying to identify that fracture that's not going to heal and has not healed uh, earlier if possible. Um, a practical definition uh, may be a fracture that has no potential to heal without further intervention. Uh, again, you're trying to predict this, and um, there's some studies recently that have tried to um, show how we could potentially predict when a non-union is going to occur. Uh, Drs. Wiss and Stetson back in 96 said that the designation of a delayed union or non-union is currently made when the surgeon believes the fracture has little or no potential to heal. So kind of saying the same thing, um, but of course, uh, there's some opinion here, uh, you know, when the surgeon believes, right? So it's difficult, but um, there are some additional terms or classification that you should be aware of uh, if you're not already. Uh, one uh, is um, hypertrophic non-union. Uh, you can also have an oligotrophic non-union. Uh, an atrophic non-union, or a pseudarthrosis. So hypertrophic non-union essentially is vascularized. Uh, callus is being made on x-ray. Um, you may have this uh, elephant's foot uh, type appearance, and we'll see a picture of that where there's abundant callus, um, or maybe a horse's, horse's hoof, but it just, it's not stable enough. Okay, so it needs stability. It's hypertrophic, there's motion, it's not stable enough. Oligotrophic means that there's callus. So there's some callus, just not quite hypertrophic. So it's not quite as an aggressive healing response, uh, but it's not atrophic either. So, and there's, you know, there's some vascularity there. Whereas atrophic is, there's no evidence of callus. Uh, it's ischemic on a bone scan or cold, I should say, on a bone scan. And um, there's typically a vascular problem. It could be infected also. Um, Pseudarthrosis, or so-called synovial pseudarthrosis, uh, is when you have, um, you kind of have like a, a fracture where the, um, the uh, canal is, let's say if it's diaphyseal, is kind of sealed off, and then you have sort of this um, synovial type pseudocapsule, uh, so to speak, that's formed and this is typically somewhat fluid filled. So you have a uh, pseudarthrosis, a false joint that forms over time. So here's the hypertrophic, the um, uh, sort of elephant's foot or horse's hoof appearance and the oligotrophic uh, appearance or you can have atrophic if there's no callus at all. That's maybe not the most perfect picture to show all the types. Clearly the hypertrophic, you can, you can see you know, the normal uh, cortices were probably about here, right, from here to here. So clearly callus is forming. The problem is it's forming outwards, right? It's forming like this, and it just keeps forming. And it's almost like the original fracture line was here. But now it looks like the fracture line extends out to here because the fracture just can't bridge. It cannot make bone to bridge across. So instead, bone just keeps coming out, you know, medially and laterally, I guess, in this case. Uh, rather than bridging across. 
Um, so you do need to understand the terms. Uh, they are important factors to consider. There, uh, you also need to think about the biologic and mechanical environment. All right, we talked a little bit about that already. Uh, you definitely need to take into account the presence or absence of infection, and you need to look for that sometimes if it's not obvious. Um, you have to determine, which can be harder, the vascularity of the fracture site, uh, the mechanical environment, how stable it is, whether there's deformity, um, and uh, which bone is involved. So there are host factors, there are injury factors, there's also factors you got to think about when the patient was initially treated that might have uh, be playing a, might be playing a role with why there's a non-union, and of course other complicating factors like infection. So we'll go through each of these. So host factors include smoking, diabetes, other endocrinopathies as shown here, um, vitamin D deficiency is a big one, uh, malnutrition, uh, medications like steroids in particular, chemotherapy, uh, bone quality, vascular status, uh, actually I forgot to mention bisphosphonates here, so things that you know essentially alter normal bone metabolism, uh, vascular status, um, and maybe a patient's compliance with weight bearing restrictions. So smoking we know is certainly not good. Uh, it decreases peripheral oxygen tension, it dampens peripheral blood flow. Uh, we, we know that there are wound healing problems with smoking. Um, with regard to fracture healing, we think it's not good. Uh, retrospective show studies uh, seem to show some increased time to union, but really don't have great studies. These slides are a little bit old, um, uh, but uh, uh, it's still something that um, we're not really, uh, we don't have great convincing evidence. So you'll have many surgeons that will not operate on someone who's a smoker for a non-union. Um, but, uh, and I think you should always encourage your patients not to smoke. It's in fact, it's a good teaching moment. Fracture is not healing. You can often tell them, look, I mean, if there's anything correctable we can do, smoking is one of them. Uh, and sometimes that is a moment where your patient may come to quit smoking and it might be helping you here. And uh, clearly there are other benefits to stop smoking, uh, you know, to other benefits for your, the patient's health. So what about diabetes? Um, and these can lead to neuropathic fractures, and it's been best studies in ankle and, and best study in ankle and pilon fractures. Um, there are increased rates of infection and soft tissue complications, increased rates of non-union. Uh, the uh, the time to union is longer, so a lot of times, like for an ankle fracture, for instance, you have to tell the patient it's going to heal twice as long. Uh, you have to keep the non-weight bearing perhaps longer, um, and uh, you know, the inability to control response to trauma can result in uh, so-called Charcot arthropathy, where you can get hyperemia, osteopenia, bone resorption. And again, this is something that's studied very well in the uh, foot and ankle. Malnutrition, something that we probably need to be doing a better job on in general, um, in many of our patient populations. Um, adequate protein and energy is required for wound healing. Um, if you can screen patients and check their serum albumin, total lymphocyte count, uh, this can often give you a clue. If you have uh, albumin less than 3.5 and a lymphocyte count less than 1,500, that may be an uh, indicator of malnutrition, and you could be putting your uh, patient at uh, risk for, um, for non-union. What about the initial uh, fracture and the injury uh, factors? Well, high-energy injuries, more likely to have... Uh, uh, slower to heal fracture. An open fracture is going to take longer than a closed fracture. If there's bone loss uh, and you have a gap, that's going to be a problem. Same thing with soft tissue injury. There could be devascularization. And you also have to think about the bone involved in the anatomic location. So open tibia shaft fracture with bone loss, certainly going to have a harder time healing than a closed non-displaced proximal humerus fracture, right? So you have you know, the uh, open or closed, you have the bone involved, uh, you have, uh, you know, diaphyseal as opposed to metaphyseal, uh, you have bone loss, right? So all these things are working against you in that case, whereas, you know, here you have closed, now I'm displaced, proximal humerus, it's metaphysis, and the humerus, it's going to heal better than the tibia, etc. What about fracture pattern? Well, higher energy injuries, combination bone loss, soft tissue injury, bone ischemia is more likely. Um, 
of unfortunately with open fractures, which is what we see a lot in the tibia, for instance, and more severe open fractures, you can have a higher incidence of non-union, and this has been shown in many older studies. Uh, of course, not all high energy fractures are open. The Cherney classification helps to emphasize that the importance of viability of the soft tissue envelope at the zone of injury. So um, uh, it's important to understand that you'll see uh, that uh, classification used often to describe severe soft tissue injuries. And here's that grading scheme. It's one of the few that starts with a zero uh, and then um, goes all the way up to the part uh, to, to, to a grade three where you're essentially having a compartment syndrome. So revascularization of ischemic bone fragments and fractures is derived from the soft tissue. So if the soft tissue is ischemic, it's got to recover first before you can revascularize the bone. Um, so what about um, non-union as a result of surgeon factors? Uh, so at the initial surgery, if there's excessive soft tissue stripping, if there's improper or unstable fixation, um, then you, know, you may have a problem. So if you create absolute stability, but then you have a gap, uh, or you have a situation of relative stability with excessive motion, um, you could potentially have a non-union. Um, what other initial treatment factors? Well, uh, if you didn't have appropriate treatment um, of a fracture, um, was you gotta ask yourself all these questions, right? Was it the appropriate management performed initially? Was the stability achieved initially? appropriate and then of course you know with all this you have to think about those same factors uh, you know in the bone anatomic location and then some patient factors as well so after operative treatment you have to ask was the appropriate implant and technique employed okay so was this a fracture that should have been treated with relative rather than absolute stability or the other way around what about direct versus indirect reduction what about the implant size, length, number of screws, locking? Was it made too, too stiff versus conventional? Was it something that was not stable enough? Um, what about the location of the incisions? Do, can you tell perhaps that this was not uh, a dissection that respected the biology? Sometimes it's hard to tell, um, but uh, these are factors that you have to take into account. With the implant itself, was it too flexible or too stiff? Was it too short? Um, was there bridge plating of a simple fracture pattern that should have just been compressed? So you got to ask yourself, why did the treatment fail? Because if you're going back to treat it again, um, you have to make sure that that treatment um, uh, was, you know, maybe had some issues that you don't want to repeat necessarily that could have caused a non-union or contributed to it. Uh, and, and so understanding the mode of failure for the initial procedure can help make sure you have success the next time. So as we already hinted to, some areas of the skeleton are at more risk for non-union because of their anatomic vascular considerations. So like the proximal fifth metatarsal is known to be an area uh, where the um, vascularity is somewhat poor, femoral neck, carpal scaphoid. Uh, you know, these are all examples where just based on the location, we know it's risk for, for non-union. Open diaphyseal tibia fractures are also one of the more common fractures you're going to see um, for these reasons as well. So um, we'll wrap this video up just on the last major um, etiology, which is infection. So of all prognostic factors, tibia fracture care, uh, that implying uh, worst prognosis was infection. This is back to 1974. So sometimes it's obvious, it's pussing out, it's open draining wounds, erythema, inadequate soft tissue coverage. Uh, but sometimes um, it's not so obvious. So subclinical infections are much more difficult. So you just have to have a high index of suspicion. Maybe if it was an open fracture and the patient has more pain than you can explain, uh, you can get lab values, CRP, um, and if anything, they can help provide a baseline value that can, you can follow later and make sure that they trend down. Uh, but you gotta deal with them and it requires bony debridement. Uh, dead bone has to come out. Uh, you have to identify the bacteria. Um, uh, oftentimes infectious disease consults can be helpful for adjuvant uh, antibiotic therapy um, and we're not going to get too much into uh, uh, operative treatment of osteomyelitis but uh, infected, infected bone uh, must be resected and then you have to provide stability uh, to help uh, resolve the infection. Uh, 
Um, so you can achieve union in the presence of infection as long as it's treated properly, which you know, really requires you know, resection of the dead bone. All right, so I'm going to pause there, and uh, we will um, pick up in the next video with uh, clinical evaluation and uh, management. Thank you.